Hello, welcome. Kalimera, buongiorno, uh, and I don't remember the better. <laughs> so I am uh, Jean-Luc Berenguet. I am the chair of Education Committee. My English is very easy to understand. I am French, as you can uh, uh, see. And um, well, I guess you are happy to be there, but usually people say, Yes. A little more. No, no, no. Okay. And be sure that all the committee is also happy to see you. The committee? Yes. <laughs> so you are more numerous than the committee. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Uh, mainly after three years of virtually gift. So for us, is, uh, it was uh, very important to come back in Vienna and we are in Vienna and we are so happy. And we hope you will enjoy this new uh, version of the gift. So you know, uh, you know the title, you know a lot of things, you know that, yeah, okay, so. Uh, Maybe you don't know, but we are celebrating uh, an uh, anniversary today uh, because it was uh, 20 years ago we, we began with the gift concept. Uh, Carlo Lai here is uh, the, the person who began this, uh, uh, this adventure with me, but uh, the adventure was a real adventure at the beginning and then become a, a template as a workshop for, for teacher. And we are very proud to, to welcome you for this uh, new uh, gift after 20 years uh, of uh, building this uh, kind of workshop for teacher inside a very big and very great institution that is the uh, European Geoscience Union. And we welcome uh, Ellen Claves, the president of EGU, we are also so happy to welcome her to, to introduce this uh, new workshop. So please, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Luc. Um, I, I have to say it, it's such a pleasure to see so many people in the room. Um, it, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, education is, is a, a core priority for, for EGU because ultimately um, you, are, you are responsible for bringing along the next generation of geoscientists and you're also bringing along the next generation of EGU members. Um, so this is, you know, as you can imagine, it, it is such a pleasure to see so many of you here. And it is also an honor for EGU to be able to give you the opportunity to be here. Um, and I do hope that you, you have, a, have a really rewarding experience. Um, I just want to say a few words building on what Jean-Luc said about the, the history of GIFT. Um, uh, as as Jean-Luc mentioned, it is, it is an auspicious moment for the gift workshops because it is the 20th year of running these. And I'm delighted to see Carlo here in the front row because he, um, along with many others, was instrumental in starting these workshops. And we're, EGU is really grateful to Carlo and those people who he worked with 20 years ago to get these workshops off the ground. So thank you, Carlo. I think EGU has benefited immensely from this initiative. And so have the huge number of teachers who have had the opportunity to participate in these workshops. So EGU is indebted to you, Carlo, and to those people along with you who started these workshops 20 years ago. I just, I just wanted to say something about um, really the, you know, the aims of these workshops. These workshops are aiming to, to give you the tools and resources to be able to really inspire the next generation of geoscientists. And I, I'm well aware from, from colleagues and friends that geoscience is, is, you know, it's becoming less of a priority in the curricula in, in a number of countries. In the UK, um, certainly, um, it, it, it kind of goes in and out of favour in the UK. 
but many of the teachers are not given the tools and resources they need to really inspire the interest in the next generation. I, I know from talking to, to a young man who lives next door to me in the UK, he thinks geology is just about dinosaurs. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of a little bit of a worrying thing. He goes, he says to me very, very enthusiastically, he's seven years old. He said to me, he said, oh, you're a geologist. My mum told me you're a geologist. He said, so, and he's got a dinosaur in his hand and he says to me, he says, so what can you tell me about this? Because this is geology. But to me, while he's got that enthusiasm, it also, you know, demonstrates that there's still so much to do to educate the next generation of geoscientists that geology is an exciting and it's a broad and it's a vivid science and, you know, it's such a pleasure to see so many of you here to actually benefit from getting the skills and the knowledge and the information, but also sharing your experiences with those sitting around with you here now and also with people from EGU um, so that you can actually, you know, have the knowledge, but also connect with people so that you can support each other in your geoscience education. So I, at this point, I do want to say some thank yous. I want to thank you for taking the time to go to come to Vienna, because I do know that you are very busy people. Teachers are expected to contribute a huge amount beyond their day to day teaching commitments. You're expected to do an awful lot to support your students in preparation. So taking time out to come here this week, I know is, is, is quite a big ask. So thank you for being here. But I also want to thank Jean-Luc and the Education Committee. There is a huge amount of work goes on behind the, the scenes to organize these workshops. So thank you to the Education Committee, because I think without them, none of this with regards to the gifts workshop was be, would be possible. So thank you to all of you. I also just want to thank all of the volunteers and also the conference assistants who are here to help because um, they again um, give very freely of their time and this includes the education committee. Um, they're, they're not paid for doing these things. They do these things for a love of you know, sharing their knowledge and expertise. Um, so I, I hope they have a rewarding experience. Um, but I hope as Jean-Luc has already said, and I think these were excellent words, um, I think um, I just hope you have a really productive workshop and, and I hope that you leave inspired to, to share the knowledge that, that you get from these workshops. Um, and I hope that, that you enjoy your time here in Vienna and you get a little bit of time to, to have, have some downtime while you're here as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, so you know that. Uh, yeah, for this so special uh, year, we, we decided to invite you uh, to look at the Agenda 2030. So um, uh, I think uh, you know already all the program. So we will begin very soon now with uh, one of our, our speaker. The first speaker is in Japan, actually. So we, you will have a first conference uh, in virtual way. It's something like a green... Uh, Plan day <laughs> uh, on the EGU. But before I will say that um, not working very well. Is, uh, maybe this. Okay. So just uh, I will want to I will want to to tell you that the gift is um, more than just a workshop. So you will have, you are 88 teacher. You come from 25 countries. You will have 18 speakers. Uh, you will stay together two days and a half uh, with a lot of uh, lecture, hands-on activity, poster session. So the workshop is this, but it's also a, a very great moment for you to networking, to make network between you, to, to spread your experience, to spread what you do in your country, in your classroom, every day, every time. And I think it's also something that is completely fantastic uh, with a gift. So please uh, do not hesitate to, to meet the other one, to spread your experience, to chat, to chat, to chat during the two days and a half. It's, 
it's very important. And uh, of course, all the things are done by a committee. This committee is 15 people. You will have to meet all of them. <laughs> Sometimes they will be uh, at my position here. Sometimes they will help you at the poster session, but uh, it's very important to, to be in contact with them because they are so happy to, to build this gift for you. So it's important to have uh, some feedback and the feedback is very important for us, for all the committee, to improve more and more uh, the, new, the, the gift for the coming years because we are not going to stop this year and we will continue gift experience for, for the future. So now I'm going to, to switch to uh, Young Ji Park. He, she is in, uh, in Japan. She is from United Nations University. And we ask her to give us a global uh, view about this uh, agenda 2030 to begin our gift. So I guess she's online now. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Jean Luc. And uh, my name is Chung Hee Park, as Jean Luc just introduced. Um, I'm from United Nations University from Tokyo. I really wish I was there in, in person in Vienna. It's actually my favorite city in Europe. And um, to be a bit more green and, and have a more um, uh, uh, environment friendly, just to the spirit of this uh, gift workshop, I'll do it virtually, but hopefully I can have another chance to visit Vienna or meet with you in a gift workshop in next years or so. Um, So my talk today is about the background of uh, sustainable development goals. And um, to explain to you about the sustainable development goals, I just want to uh, track back a bit to the Millennium Development Goals in 1990s. Um, uh, and then I will focus more on the SDG number four, which is quality education uh, among the 17 SDGs. And then I will focus on two uh, sub group of uh, sustainable development goal, goal number four, which is education for sustainable development and also education for relevant skills, uh, which might be of your interest as teachers. So let's start. Um, Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. So Millennium Development Goals was started in 1990s and then culminated in nine, 2015. And sustainable development goal started in 2015 until 2030 that we are we, we are going to achieve. We have to uh, achieve, I guess, by 2030. So my question is uh, to you: um, What would be the biggest differences between the MDGs and SDGs? Anyone? Just a shout out from the audience. Number, number, number. Number, yes. Anybody else? Content. Content. Okay, so let me look at the two different frameworks. Okay, so MDGs, of course, there are uh, more goals in SDGs than MDGs. MDGs started with eight goals when SDGs uh, in 2015 uh, had have 17 goals, right? But there are more, um, um, more than just number of goals that are different. There are three main differences that I can come up with to explain to you a bit uh, easier. So in the MDG era, the main mission was to end the poverty. So as you could see, uh, to end poverty, uh, it was actually the mission for the developing countries. And as a result, actually, the developed countries, like many countries in Europe, Americas, or East Asian countries, um, their interest was not there because uh, most of the goals that um, MDG addressed, such as, um, um, sorry, such as the achieve the primary education for all or reducing child mortality, or um, 
improve mater maternal health. All of these are actually already achieved by many of the developed countries. So in those era, actually, there are not many people in developed countries are interested in these MDGs. So to include uh, interest of all the developed countries and also to reflect more complex and, and more complicated world since uh, 1990s in the, in the MDG era, um, there are more goals uh, included in these SDGs, which are now 17. Lastly, education is now a key to achieve the other 16 SDGs rather than one isolated um, goal in MDG. So in MDG era, it was just isolated goal to achieve universal primary education, meaning we want to put more students, more children into the primary schools. But in SDGs, um, the education is more for inclusive and quality education for every um, SDG, uh, which is 16 other SDGs. So if you think about it, that's why I think we are here today. If you think about climate action, life below water, life on land, uh, water, sanity, sanity, and other things like uh, energy that probably our geoscience teachers are of the communities are interested. You can easily uh, imagine that uh, we cannot really achieve these goals without educating or empowering the individual or students in the young generation, right? So you can see uh, education is, a is now positioned as the key enabler to achieve the other 16 SDGs. Let's go back to the MDG again, the uh, Education for Era, which was ended in 2015, to explain the background or the context a bit more. So in the MDG era, um, in the 1990s until 2015, 15, um, as you could see, um, primary education uh, for all and achieve gender equality are actually the main uh, target for the MDG or education for all movements. And as a result, the, the world actually achieved um, one from 100 million students who are out of school. At the end of this MDG era, we had 57 million um, children who are out of school which is uh, about 43 million less than 2000. So we put actually 43 million students more into the primary school. So it's a big achievement. And most of them are actually from Sub-Saharan Africa. So Sub-Saharan Africa in 1990s, there were only 52% of the students or the age group of primary school are in the primary school. But at the end of this MDG era in 2015, about 80% of the age group of the primary school students are actually in the school. So this is a big achievement in MDG, but there were side effects to this um, universal primary education. So as a teacher, <clears throat> you can also shout out again, what would be the side effect of the education for all movement by putting more students into the school, in primary schools? Think about your, your, your uh, schools. If you have more students, what would happen? Yeah, you need more resources, right? More resources. Um, also, um, you may need another teacher in your in your classroom too, right? If uh, you are having from twenty five students to fifty students, for example, you probably need another teacher or another classroom actually to divide them into uh, different classrooms, right? But unfortunately, many of the developing countries were not ready actually to, to supply more teachers. So we are actually suffering now the shortage of teachers in many developing countries. 
Another side effect, because we accepted a lot of uh, students' children into the primary school, after primary school, what would they do? They have to go up to the upper level of education, for example, lower secondary, secondary school, and higher education. But in many countries, again, uh, especially upper secondary and universities are not ready to accommodate the influx of um, increased number of students. So that was another uh, side effect. And as a result of actually shortage of teachers and upper learning uh, institutes, what happened is now global learning crisis. This graph shows um, the percentage of the students, children and adolescents at the end of their primary school and the, at the end of their lower secondary who did not achieve the minimum proficiency in math and reading. Okay, so in the world average, we have more than half of the students at the end of their primary school and at the end of lower secondary, they don't properly read or write <laughs> and they cannot do the simple math that their um, uh, education level requires. That's the word average. You probably would not sense this in your context in Europe because you have uh, about 14% like only in um, your uh, context in Europe and North America, which is still a lot. If you think about it, uh, you could have 10%, 15%, 14% of your students in your classroom at the end of the uh, lower secondary, they don't really read or write properly or they cannot really do the simple math. If you look at the Sub-Saharan Africa and then Central Southern Asia, the numbers are really uh, shocking or right? stunning, right? So 84% of the Sub-Saharan African students um, are not able to read or write at the end of their um, uh, or to simple math at the end of their schooling. So this is global learning crisis that how we can actually uh, improve the quality of learning, not the quantity of education. So with this backdrop, actually the SDG number four education 2030 agenda started. And now it's not just about the quantity or putting more students into the education system, but it's more to um, equitable quality education and lifelong learning. So we are thinking beyond the quantity. Now we are talking about quality and we are thinking beyond the primary school. It has to be lifelong learning. So these are the key two, two keywords, uh, quality education and lifelong learning for uh, Education 2030 Agenda. So for the new targets for the Education 2030 Agenda um, are the following seven, actually we, we call it seven targets of SDG number four, uh, 20, uh, Education 2030 Agenda. So the first one is free equitable primary and secondary education for good quality. Number two is universal pre-primary education, which is kindergarten or um, pre-primary school. Number three is relevant skills development for employment, which is about lifelong learning. Number four is universal literacy and numeracy. Number five is more qualified teachers to reflect the shortage of teachers. Number six, make higher education more accessible. As I said, uh, uh, the shortage of higher education is also an issue in many developing countries. And finally, number seven, knowledge and skills for sustainable development including global citizenship, climate change, um, cultural understanding, conflict, right-based, and so on and so forth. So for today, I will only focus on the two things, relevant skills uh, development for employment and then knowledge and skills for sustainable development. So education for sustainable development is addressing the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, as I mentioned before. 
And sustainable development for education for sustainable development is actually not new. It has been around for 30 years to believe or not. So this education for sustainable development first declared importance in 1992 in one of the UN conferences. And if you think about the fact that this was 30 years ago, and if we educators or our previous generation of educators had done their work well in educating young people to have sufficient knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development, this figure from IPCC sixth report should not have been there, in my opinion. We should not have the situation where we are facing the irreversible point of global warming. We are limiting warming to 1.5 degree Celsius is beyond our reach, no matter what we do um, now. Right, so this is very um, kind of devastating points about the efficiency, efficacy of ESD so far. And uh, UNESCO actually published this um, uh, study uh, on the national curriculum analysis of the countries around the globe. And globally, actually only 56% of the countries include climate education in their national school curriculum. So the rest 44% don't have any climate change education in their school curriculum. You could probably think about your own country's context. And why the conceptualization of this education for sustainable development is important is because the, the data shows Every country has a different situation in terms of sustainable development, especially in terms of climate change. Um, this is the global data on source of CO2 emission, global data, right? So the biggest emission uh, source is energy system, followed by industry, agriculture, transportation, and building, heating, uh, cooking, those things. So this is a global data, but if you look at the local data or national data, it has a different story. For example, Indonesia, agriculture is the biggest emitter. In Germany, electricity by coal is the biggest emitter. In Austria, the industry and transportation is the biggest source of the emission. And in Switzerland, transportation and building heating and cooking are the biggest source of the CO2 emission. So we really have to, as an educator, we really have to translate this global agenda of uh, climate change and, and emission issues into the local context. So how to translating this uh, global agenda into the local context is a really key in educating our children or students in climate change or sustainable development in a, in a bigger context. Another issue with education for sustainable development is its overemphasis on cognitive skills. This is another study by UNESCO and uh, they analyzed the three aspects of uh, education for sustainable development learning. Uh, which are cognitive learning, social, emotional aspects, and behavioral learning. So they analyzed the national curriculum of uh, all the countries around the globe and then try to see what are the main aspects that national curriculum of education for sustainable development are focusing on. And across the three levels of education, primary education, secondary education, and tertiary education, you can see it's overemphasis on the cognitive aspects of education for sustainable development. So we are actually teaching them what are the emission, what's the biggest contribution of the emission and all those things, but we don't really teach them how to act to solve those issues. So we really have to rethink what we are going to teach and how we are going to teach them to change their actions to be uh, the, the the solution, the part of the solution to the sustainable development. 
one of the ways that we could, uh, as a UN, UN, UN university, could uh, propose or to suggest is community-based e uh, education for sustainable, sustainable development. Uh, the UNU, U United Nations University, is actually a secretariat for these regional centers of expertise on education for sustainable development, or RCEs. And it's a network of formal, non-formal, and formal education institution for localizing education for sustainable development. As of today, we have a, about 185 members. And these are the members from European countries that I just uh, uh, listed for you. You can probably see your own countries and then some communities around you. So you can always contact them actually to see whether uh, there are some projects that you as an educator to contribute to localize the global issues into the local context of your own community. Another tips uh, would be these three publications by uh, United Nations University on these um, uh, RCEs. You can download from this uh, QR code. And um, we have uh, promising cases from uh, different world, different uh, communities, on certain issues of uh, sustainable development. For example, uh, in 2012, 2021, we did uh, uh, case studies on the climate action. Uh, last year, we did a case study on the biodiversity conservation with community-based ESD. And then finally this year, we are going to publish in, um, in May on the sustainable consumption and production and how uh, the community actually lead um, community-based education for sustainable development together with the formal, non-formal education uh, institutions. For example, in uh, RCE Vietnam, uh, they, they with, together with the universities, they train the local farmers for sustainable farming. In RCE Denmark, they transformed or reformed the vocational training curriculum for sustainable construction methodology. In RC Helsinki, um, they used the schoolyard to uh, teach our children in a school, actually it's a formal school, it's a K-12 school, to um, teach them uh, the ecosystem um, of the uh, local context. It was a place-based learning. And there are many more great cases that you can um, refer to, to contextualize your learning uh, ESD into your local context. Um, the second and the last part of uh, rethinking education is um, uh, education in an era of disruptive technology. I would like to uh, use this because we need to think about what to teach uh, our children in this technology dominant era. And uh, my formal job actually was at UNESCO uh, on ICT in education or technology and education specialist. So I really want to brought up, bring up this issue to our teachers in uh, Give the Workshop too. Um, what are we going to teach? Um, sustainable development, one of the sustainable development um, enabler is actually technology too, as you could see. But what we need to teach in terms of digital skills for our children is actually, uh, shouldn't be just uh, digital skills. So in terms of uh, sustainable development, also uh, the global citizenship's perspective, digital skills should be expanded to digital citizenship uh, competencies. So we actually did a um, um, study at UNESCO, at UNESCO to assess what are the um, key areas that our children are actually good at or poor at in terms of digital citizenship competencies. So uh, the five domains uh, that we identified as a digital citizenship competencies for digital literacy, digital safety and resilience, digital participation, digital emotional intelligence, and digital creativity and innovation. 
And we tested this with um, different countries, four countries. And in um, four countries in Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, Korea, and Fiji. And um, I just showed a, a bit of a graph before by accident, but can you guess uh, actually which uh, competencies our students are very good at and then still need more improvement? Which area, which aspect do you think our students are the best? in terms of digital citizenship competencies. Digital. Creativity, innovation. Creativity and innovation. Yeah, I, I got actually that answer a lot. I think it's a hope that we are uh, hoping that our students are actually creative and innovative in digital environment, right? But to our surprise, actually, this is the result of the study. Um, this is digital literacy, digital safety and resilience, digital participation, digital, in innovate, uh, digital emotional intelligence, and digital creativity and innovation, right? As you could see, the highest competencies were digital safety and resilience, and the lowest was the digital creativity and innovation. So what does it is tell? We interpreted this result as we, as an educator, we probably overemphasized digital safety in our school. So they are really well aware of what they have to do in terms of digital safety and resilience. But we probably don't give them enough opportunity to create or, or foster their digital creativity and innovation. Okay. So, I know our, all the teachers, as me, as an educator also, as a parent also, we don't really trust our teenagers and, and kids to uh, from, I mean, in, in using technology daily life. But at the same time, we need to guide them to use it more safely, responsibly, responsibly or effectively to uh, actually create their, foster their digital creativity and innovation. And this is especially true in the era of ChatGPT. I know every teachers nowadays is really pulling their hair about this ChatGPT, what we are going to do with ChatGPT. Um, actually in um, OECD, they did a very interesting study um, last year, even before the ChatGPT was uh, on the rise this year. So last year they uh, used their own AI actually to answer their um, Europe, I mean, OECD country international assessment for adult competencies. So adult competencies uh, comprise of uh, numeracy and literacy, adult literacy, adult numeracy, and adult problem solving skills. And they do it actually, OECD do it is every 10 years. And last year they just gave the test to the AI to see how much AI can actually score it. And it was even before ChatGPT. And then this AI solved 80% of literacy and then 66% of the numeracy. More surprisingly, those are actually better than top 10% of the human adults in OECD countries, and then better than top 12% um, of the uh, human adults on OE in OECD countries. And in 2026, by 2026, OECD predicts the AI will be able to solve all the literacy and numerous tests. And I believe this would be much shorter than uh, three years from now. So, then um, our question is, what are we really going to teach our students in an era of AI? Um, in actually, uh, the, the Bill, Gates, Bill Gates Foundation actually now are, are a big funder of this open AI. And then uh, open AI uh, was tested by Bill Gates in, um, I think it was, um, 
uh, June last year. And June last year, actually, Bill Gates asked the OpenAI team to train an artificial intelligence, which is ChatGPT, to pass an advanced placement biology exam. Okay, it, it requires actually critical thinking. It's not just a yes or no question. And Bill Gates thought that it would take about a year or two to have this mission completed. But then to his surprise, it took only three months, four months to for ChatGPT to score 59 out of 60, the highest possible score in a college level biology course. So it was actually a very scary moment. And uh, we really have to think what we are going to teach our students uh, in geoscience as well. Um, the ChatGPT, I mean, this blog as well as the OECD the report actually are saying that now it's time for us to think um, how to teach our students to use ChatGPT or AI in a more effective way to replace their um, literacy skills or numeracy skills because literacy numeracy is basically what AI can do better. So it's a critical thinking problem solving skills, but also how to use AI in a more effective way. That's something that we need to think about for the next few years. I mean, maybe the next few months. Okay, I, that's it for, from me. I just added one slide on the United Nations University for any of you who are interested. And then thank you very much for your attention.